the Tolosa Railway Yard near La Plata in Argentina. Like so many railway graveyards around the world, it tells a story of neglect and decline. These rusting hulks are memorials to Argentina's once great railways. And for those who worked on them, the dereliction is a poignant reminder of the past. Here there were, at one time, over 6,000 work people. Today there are 220, perhaps. And uh, the abandonment that you see in the grass and the buildings and the... makes it rather sad for me. I was very active here. In fact, the start of my career. It's very sad to see it. All over the world, railways are in decay. The pioneers who created them believed they were building for the future, a permanent answer to the problems of transporting goods and people. Permanent, that is, until people stopped using them. Even in cities, railways have had to fight an unequal battle with other transport. In Los Angeles, car capital of the world, they lost the battle altogether. The way societies choose their transport is far from simple. Decisions today about roads and rail and public transport will dramatically affect life for generations. But those judgments can be perilous. Predicting the future is always very hard uh, because most of the time people get it wrong if you're talking about really big changes. And I remember when I was uh, a boy in the late 40s and early 50s, everybody assumed the helicopter was going to take over from the car. The helicopter age is here, but there aren't two in every garage yet. It's going to be a while before Pop can sleep an extra half hour mornings because he's riding a copter to work. They claim any housewife can learn to fly it alone in an hour. It can go 85 miles an hour, gets eight miles per gallon of gasoline, flies two and a half hours without refueling. That proved uh, never to happen, and imagine what life would be like if we had traffic congestion in three dimensions rather than in two. It would probably be an environmental nightmare. Um, it clearly indicates that we've been fascinated throughout our history with modes of transportation, forms of transportation, but we've not been very good predictors of what the future will actually hold. In the 1950s, America's Union Pacific Railroad envisaged a future driven by technology. As always, the story of railroad progress will be written by a dynamic industry whose emblem is the flanged wheel. The discussion here is about the practicability of an atomic-powered locomotive. Can you get enough shielding to protect against external radiation? Well, we have 10 feet here, Bob that uh, we can work in and here... This exchange is one of the strengths of railroad research. Engineers alone could never determine the future of the railways. For their ideas to be adopted, they would always need allies in business, politics, or public opinion. In every country, there had to be a reason for the railways. Someone had to have a stake in them for the dreams of engineers to take shape. For the railway pioneers of the 19th century, their purpose was not solely transport. In Argentina, their objectives were very clear, simply to make money out of the country.
Today, the money spinning days are over. Now it is a constant battle with obsolete equipment for the men at the Tolosa signal box. A train is coming through from La Plata towards Gringalis. We lower the signals. It is a system of levers, but because the levers are so old, they are very heavy. This has a continuous bad effect on our health. It causes back trouble, a lot of problems, even psychologically, because we never seem to get away from the problems of the trains. So I lower the signal, give the all clear for the train to go through to the next station. When it's passed, I gradually change the signals to avoid accidents. This is what we do. At the same time, we have to look after the trains going the other way, towards La Plata. At the turn of the century, Argentina had one of the most efficient railway systems in the world. It was a key to the country's prosperity. Argentina was never a British colony, but in the early 1900s, British finance dominated her economy. By 1914, Argentina was the world's third largest exporter and the fastest growing economy in South America. The railways made it all possible. They opened up the country and uh, they replaced the oxen hauled uh, uh, carts, which took months to arrive with uh, tides, cereals, whatever, which in a few hours were transported very quickly and very easily by the railways. That was the beginning. And of course, they opened up and expanded because this was the same as what had happened in Africa, in Asia, in India, all over the world. Uh, the British railways expanded the countries wherever they went. And this was one of them. And they prospered in those days. As profits flowed out of the country in one direction, key personnel like Peter Curtis came from Britain to seek their fortune in the railway business. There were drivers, farmen imported, as well as the bosses, uh, foremen level up, and of course the, the heads of departments. They were all English-speaking people. Well, each person understood his position respected it and everybody carried out their duties as they were assigned and uh, they made a slight profit and the shareholders i believe uh, in at home were grateful they got their money back but that wasn't the only financial benefit to britain everything from stations to locomotives and rolling stock was british made Moreover, the coal that powered the trains came from British mines, up to 55 million tons a year. A significant proportion of Britain's coal exports was shipped halfway round the world. Uh, the British uh, uh, railways uh, were sort of a two-edged weapon in Argentina because they would uh, they would favor products that were uh, essential for the uh, British economy, but uh, they would not favor uh, uh, the natural internal markets of Argentina. In 1946, a new era in Argentine politics began. General Perón's populist government wanted to put Argentina's interests first. Top of his agenda, was nationalization of the railways. In Tafí Viejo, la metrópoli de los ferroviarios, sede de los talleres más grandes de la nación, la fiesta es caracteres de apoteosis. Los trabajadores del riel ven como el sueño de varias generaciones es llevado a la realidad. Los trenes que construyeron merced al sacrificio ya son patrimonio de la nación. Desde ahora, no trabajarán más para un dueño residente allá de los mares. El esfuerzo de cada uno se ofrendará solamente ante el altar de la patria. The 
the campaign for the nationalization of the railways started long before the Peron government. This was supported by most of the people, as we can see in, in, in the films and the newsreels that show the day of nationalization. And we have the, to uh, understand the policy of nationalization as only a, a step uh, of a wider context. This has to do with the nationalization of our public services and with a new outlook on the development of the economy in Argentina that started with the Peron government. The objective was all the profits flowing to Europe could be kept within Argentina and benefit Argentinians. Very noble idea. And it was with great national pride and national objectives that these assets were purchased by Argentina. The problem came afterwards. The objectives, the purpose of the nationalized institutions got lost. Was the railroad there to provide transportation? Was it there to provide employment? Was it there to provide the need for public works? What was the function? The function and the objectives of the institution got lost, not only here, other countries as well. But here, the loss was more profound. Under Perón, the railways, already in need of modernization, started to disintegrate through lack of investment. Well, it was horrible, terrible, wicked, madness. That's the railway's fault, because they didn't pursue and keep and protect their business. They let it go. Whereas before there were no roads, now there are. And the strange thing is that people haven't learned that what can be hauled on a railway requires hundreds of motorized vehicles to transport. And subsequent costs are much higher. Have they forgotten that basic fact? Forty years on, Argentina's economy and railways were in a mess, neglected by successive military regimes. Uh, given the sort of uh, situation that uh, we found uh, two or three years ago, uh, one could say that uh, in no more than five years, the railways would have disappeared completely. In fact, we could say that half of the system have disappeared already uh, if we account for the number of locomotives that are working, it's only 45% of the total fleet, uh, more than 50% of the network is in bad shape. The same can apply to all other items of, of, of the railway itself. In which case, I think that uh, the country would have fallen in a chaos in transport terms. Foreign capital was brought in by the Menem government of 1989. Lacking investment, they decided to denationalize the system and return it to the private sector. See? See? The new management aims to turn the network back into profit, using a strategy that will mean a dramatic reduction in the size of the system. <laughs> 